Okay, thanks for joining me today. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Darlene McLennan, and I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training, ADSET for short. This webinar is being live captioned, and to activate the captions, click the CC button in the toolbar that is located either on the top or the bottom of your screen. We also have captions available via a web browser, and Jane will now put that into the chat box for you to access. We're also having this event um, uh, Auslan interpreted and we will be spotlighting the, um, the interpreter at the time who is um, interpreting. Um, so I am coming to you from Lutchawitta, Tasmanian Aboriginal land. And in the spirit of reconciliation, ADSET respectfully acknowledges the Lutchawitta nations and also recognises Aboriginal history and the culture of the land. And I pay my respects to elders, past and present, and to the many Aboriginal people that did not make elder status. I also want to acknowledge all the countries participating in this meeting and also acknowledge their elders and ancestors and their legacy to us and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the um, webinar today. Feel free to also in the chat, um, acknowledge where you are today. Well, today's webinar is Changing Faces of Learning Disability Diagnosis. Um, and response um, by Mandy Nayton. Mandy has a wealth of experience and I've worked with Mandy off and on for the last 18 years. Um, Mandy has for a long time been the president of the Federation of um, Spelled Organisations from across Australia, Ausspelled. Um, and you can see more about Mandy and her experience um, and so forth on our website um, in, our, in the bio information. Mandy's going to um, provide uh, a review of the current Pacific Learning Disabilities diagnosis and the parameters of imputed disability and how best to determine the level of functional impact in individual cases. But before we begin the presentation, just a few more housekeeping details. As I said, this webinar is being captioned and um, Auslan interpreted. Um, the recording will be available on ADSET in the coming days. But if you're having any technical difficulties, you can email us at admin at adset.edu.au. The presentation will run for around 50 minutes. And at the end, we will have 10 minutes for Mandy to answer some questions. Feel free, free I'm not talking very well, feel free in the, um, throughout the presentation to have a chat with each other in the box and just remember to choose the um, all button so that everybody can see all panellists and attendants. Um, but then if you have a question that you want us to ask Mandy, can you please put that in the Q&A box? Um, we have allowed the upvoting, so you can actually click the thumbs up icon. And so the, the most popular questions from the Q&A box will go to the top, which will enable it for us easily to be able to answer those questions. So yeah, feel free to chat in the chat and put the questions in the Q&A box. Well, that's it from me. I'll see you at the end of the presentation in 50 minutes, but now I'll hand over to you, Mandy. Thank you. So Mandy, just- Unmute myself. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Which is always the trick. Um, so fantastic to be joining everybody um, for this session. Um, we've got an awful lot to get through um, in a very short amount of time. So it will be a little bit of a kind of whistle stop tour. Um, but before I start, I would actually like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land from which I am presenting, the, the Wujuk people of the Noongar Nation, and to all First Australians, recognising their rich culture and the connections they have to the land and water. I would also like to acknowledge the significant contribution made by First Nations people to the, to the education that we do provide and the languages that we use. So that um, is an important way, place to start. So I'm just gonna share my screen, um, which I think is uh, what happens next. Is that right? Is that being shared or not? No, not yet, Mary, no, so yet, try okay. again. Let me just go back in there and try that again. Um, Sorry, I had it up there before and now suddenly I'm struggling to share it. 
how many practices we get and I know. Try that one more time. Yep, we're just seeing it as a full. Yep, there we go. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. About that, I managed to go into the wrong box. Um, so um, the aim for today is to um, whip through these dot points, um, looking at a little bit of history as to where the diagnosis and um, I guess identification of uh, learning disorders um, has come from and through the various steps. Um, response to intervention, what a specific learning disorder is, assessing specific learning disorders uh, with a short amount of time spent on imputed disability, uh, determining the level of functional impact uh, and potentially appropriate adjustments that can be made and ideally a little bit of time on what might be the next steps. So as you can see, a lot to get through. Um, and each of these little dot points could be probably a, a day in itself. Okay, so a little bit of history about the models of specific learning disorders that we are aware of. Essentially, um, one of the most prevalent models for a very long period of time was the aptitude achievement discrepancy model, the notion that uh, a learning disorder could be diagnosed or identified by um, looking at what a student's aptitude um, or potential was through things like IQ testing um, and how they were actually achieve, achieving. Um, if there was a massive discrepancy between two, these two things, it was identified perhaps that they had a learning disorder. Um, this was viewed in many ways as being fairly inequitable um, and also a wait to fail approach. Um, and one of the approaches that was looked at as an alternative was simply identifying those students who consistently achieved well below their peers over a period of time. Um, this also presented a lot of uh, additional issues with regard to diagnosis simply because of the um, comorbid uh, conditions that could be being missed, um, the fact that again it was a wait to fail model and the notion that in order to be showing a low achievement over a significant period of time, um, there was a feeling that students were simply being left to their own devices. There was then a period of time where individual differences in terms of across a student's profile were examined and things such as the ACID or SCAD profile were identified as being one method of actually identifying students who had perhaps a learning disorder. In other words, they were recognised or they were considered to be key um, factors that if they were showing up on a student's profile, it was indicative of a learning disorder. So with the ACID profile, we had um, arithmetic, coding, information and digit span as being four subtests from um, a, a cognitive ability or IQ test um, that would supposedly show a learning disorder. Um, the SCAD was the symbol search, coding, arithmetic and digit span subtests. So these kind of profiles were seen as perhaps one way to go in identifying students with learning disorders. Again, there were seen to be a lot of problems with these models. There were too many false positives and positive negatives and every possible combination you could hope for. Um, lots of students were being missed in this approach. The most recent over the last couple of decades um, thinking has been that the best model to use for identification of learning disorders is a hybrid model. It is actually looking at those students who seem to persistently struggle uh, and therefore are um, performing in terms of the achievement of a key academic skill um, uh, below their peers. Um, but in addition to this, there is the caveat that high quality intervention has been trialled. It has been put in place, an attempt has been made to address the underlying weakness or area of weakness. So the, the idea that there would be um, a measure of how well the student responded to intervention was, was put into play as a, an important component um, of the definition. 
in all of these approaches um, and models that have been used, there has always been what is referred to as exclusionary criteria. In other words, there is the view that for it to be a specific learning disorder by definition, um, with the emphasis on specific, um, we need to exclude other more plausible explanations for why the student may be struggling. So excluding um, a complete lack of attendance at school, for example, or excluding um, significant socio-emotional problems, um, excluding a significant language difficulty, either in terms of the language of instruction or a language disorder. So there are always exclusionary criteria. In terms of DSM-5, um, the exclusionary criteria are stated as being learning disabilities are not considered to be the direct result of intellectual disability, physical and sensory deficits or emotional difficulties. Neither do they appear to derive directly from inadequate environmental experiences or a lack of appropriate educational experiences. The appropriate educational experiences caveat um, includes intervention um, and support. So it is the notion that many students will struggle somewhat learning to read, learning to write, learning basic mathematics, um, but we need to provide some intervention and support to check to see whether they have just simply missed some of the foundation areas. So this component of response to intervention um, is a really important part of the hybrid model, which is now the most prevalent model that is used. When we talk about response to intervention, it is really a model, a service delivery model um, that is used in education settings. And this can be at a, an early childhood education setting. It can be at a, at a university level setting. The notion is it's uh, designed around data um, and the decision making that takes place is based on the data that is collected. And we look at this process as including data from screening, data from monitoring of student progress, and also the inclusion of a multi-tiered system of support. So initially we have the, the screening that takes place at either when the student is arriving at the education setting or early in their um, time or on a regular basis of some sort, but that screening may lead to some targeted intervention. The student's progress is then monitored and supported. Um, and it may be that as a result of perhaps um, ongoing and persistent difficulties, um, it becomes more and more important to put in place specific adjustments and accommodations and to continue with the intervention that has been put in place uh, following the screening. So we see this kind of continuum happening, ideally in a response to intervention model. And again, if we're talking about early childhood, it's quite clear to see how that might work. If we're talking about perhaps a university setting, it's a little less clear as to how that might actually play out um, in terms of the screening, the intervention, um, the progress monitoring, and then the um, support. So again, when we're talking about a multi-tiered system of support um, in terms of that levels that we would hope to see in an education setting, the idea that tier one is absolutely high quality instruction um, the most effective type of instruction that we believe um, can be put in place to ensure that the maximum number of students actually um, do um, achieve at a high level. Tier one is that, as I say, high quality, explicit, systematic, carefully designed instruction that will maximise outcomes for the vast majority of students. And in many ways, high quality tier one instruction is the best intervention um, and accommodation that a student with a learning disorder can have. Tier two is about supporting students potentially in small groups or in some kind of way um, when they start falling behind uh, their peers. Tier three is really about intensive intervention. If you have a student who really struggles with writing essays, 
um, then you are talking about how do we address this student's need in terms of um, essay writing and um, some very comprehensive intervention. Um, so that's what a multi-tiered system of support looks like. It's really important to remember that response to intervention does not diagnose. It's not a diagnosis in itself, um, the idea that a student hasn't responded to uh, intervention. However, it is part of a comprehensive diagnostic process. So it doesn't classify, doesn't really individualize, and it doesn't diagnose. Um, it's important to kind of always remember that that's, that's not the purpose of response to intervention. So when we're thinking about RTI beyond the school years, um, it's actually a challenge uh, very often in post-secondary settings um, to identify how, um, how well delivered an individual uh, students, um, first of all, their education has been and then any intervention that they have been provided. Um, it can be a bit of a minefield to uh, get into and, and it can be um, something where the the information available is very limited and it makes it difficult to kind of go down the RTI path in many ways. Um, it's also difficult to determine whether there really have been persistent and enduring problems in the particular academic skill that we're focused on um, during the school years as well. So we have to rely on information that can be collected through reports, work samples, and student interview um, very often. So if we talk about what we really do mean by a specific learning disorder, um, we look at them as being, or we consider them to be neurodevelopmental disorders. And this is how they're described in um, the diagnostic manual, uh, but also most widely um, accepted in terms of um, the classification of a learning disorder. Um, in terms of the Disability Discrimination Act, part of what we consider um, for learning, for students with learning disorders is the fact that they have a, um, a condition that means that they um, learn differently from a person without the condition. So it is that kind of notion that this is a, again, persistent and enduring difficulty that is related to person's development, um, that means that for them, learning this particular key academic skill is much more challenging than for their peers, um, despite reasonable education and intervention. In terms of the terminology, the terms disability, disorder and difficulty are often used interchangeably. So we see specific learning disability, specific learning disorder, uh, learning difficulty. Um, and very often in terms of the um, writing or things that are available through education systems, uh, they can be um, you know, interchanged. So there is a, an overlap there. However, when it comes to diagnostic terminology, um, we do tend to use the term specific learning disorder. Um, and then with impairment in, uh, whether it's reading, whether it's written expression, or whether it's mathematics, um, with more detail attached to that particular classification. So it could be reading in terms of accuracy and fluency, or it could be reading in terms of comprehension and so on. So the term specific learning disorder is used. Um, there is a more widely accepted practice now of using a term, the term learning difference, um, which in some ways fits with what is written in the DDA, but in many ways it perhaps um, sometimes diminishes the extent to which um, the student really does face major hurdles. Um, the argument could be had that everybody learns to some extent differently, uh, that we all have different preferences in the way in which we learn and, and different sort of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and that perhaps talking about a difference doesn't, doesn't sort of give a sense of the gravity that for some students, um, their learning disorder presents. So it really is 
um, a matter of the particular purpose um, for which the um, terminology is being used. So we talk about a specific learning disorder as being an umbrella term for three key academic areas or difficulties in three key academic areas, reading, written expression and mathematics. Um, and these three areas um, are sometimes referred to as dyslexia, dysgraphia and dyscalculia. However, we very rarely use the term dysgraphia anymore for written expression disorders because it is generally accepted that we talk about motor dysgraphia in terms of those difficulties with handwriting uh, and very often motor related difficulties um, rather than uh, what we mean by written expression disorders um, which relate to the difficulties a student may have actually getting their thoughts um, down onto paper in a coherent and fluent way. So we have SLDs with um, uh, in, in the key academic area and for example when we talk about specific learning disorders with impairment in reading as I say that could relate to accuracy, fluency and or comprehension. In terms of written expression we're generally looking at spelling, grammar, clarity and organisation and when we talk about mathematics we're talking about number sense, number facts, calculation and reasoning. If we are talking about dyscalculia, it really does relate to those first three um, areas, number sense, number facts and calculation rather than reasoning. And when we're talking about dyslexia, we really are focused much more on the accuracy and fluency of reading. So the other factors that we need to consider when we're thinking about specific learning disorders um, is that it is considered, uh, learning disorders are considered to be neurobiological. Um, with a high um, prevalence uh, in families. So, so there's a strong genetic predisposition. Um, we need to think about the behavioural and, behavioral and psychosocial factors. Um, we know that students with learning disorders are at greater risk of mental health um, uh, issues um, and challenges, which in turn lead to more learning difficulties. And we get this kind of unfortunate the vicious cycle taking place. Um, we always would suggest that they are persistent and enduring. There is no easy cure that will simply take the learning disorder away. Having said that, we can do a lot to reduce the impact of learning disorders. Um, and what we often find is that um, learning disorders are associated with a processing weakness of some sort which in turn can have an impact, particularly as students get older, on the output of their work and the time that they need to spend on it. Um, so this is an important kind of area of consideration. We use a wide range of cognitive processes when we are doing any of these key academic skills. So they are all very challenging cognitively. So we think about the areas of executive functioning and the notion that we are looking at um, uh, and, and this is kind of the bits of covering up my screen on my, I'm not sure whether I can get rid of any of these bits, but anyway, um, the areas of um, planning, uh, executing active and purposeful reading, um, planning essays, writing essays, problem solving and so on, all of these areas of executive functioning um, are critically important for students in almost all of these academic skills. And again, become more important as students get older. Um, we see a huge reliance on executive functioning for students um, as they um, move into uh, areas such as secondary school and tertiary education. It's also important to remember that um, an individual's executive functioning system only really matures at the age of about 25. So when young people, and they are still young people, are entering university at 18 and 19, their executive functioning system is not is still not completely mature. Um, it still has a little way to go. Um, it's obviously more um, extreme when we're talking about young children in primary school settings <laughs> in terms of the challenges for them with executive functioning. But, um, but certainly it's, it's worth bearing in mind that the executive function system does not fully mature till about 25. Um, 
the capacity to rapidly scan, um, to process information at speed, effortlessly um, continues to develop. But again, some people have much poorer processing of visual information. Not that they have a, 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 a vision impairment or weakness of any kind. It's more that they simply process visual information at a slower rate than their peers, which again, can actually have an impact on their output and on their capacity to read large volumes of text, for example. And then our ability to process language, um, not just the phonological information in terms of that's needed for reading and spelling accuracy, but also just the body of knowledge people have stored in their long-term memory, their access to different schema that will allow them to respond um, to different subject areas uh, successfully. Um, and again, this has a huge, um, hu has a huge impact on a student's capacity to deal with courses. Um, part of our kind of research um, in the work that we've been doing is looking at um, a, a sort of profile of students when they come to DSF for assessments um, and looking at 1,367 cases of students who had a reading difficulty or reading disorder um, and had been diagnosed with a reading disorder. What we see, which is kind of interesting, is that by the time students are in secondary, there is a slightly different profile that we are seeing for many students. And one in two has a working memory problem. This has huge implications for um, life in the tertiary sector. Um, there's less of a concern around the phonological as there, there is in, um, uh, at, at other ages. But there's a very high percentage of students, uh, nearly 60%, who have what we call rapid automatised naming difficulties, meaning that their fluency is poor. So they will often have poor reading fluency and they will very often have poor writing fluency. Um, and the capacity to write fluently um, requires that you can write accurately, effortlessly, with meaning and at an appropriate rate. So that's a high percentage of students at secondary who are presenting with difficulties in these areas. Um, and it was it's highly likely that it would be very similar um, at a tertiary level. So when we think about how we assess um, learning disorders, again, we've already mentioned to some extent what this might look like um, because we've talked a bit about the um, different models that have been used. And these, these relate very uh, clearly to the assessment process. Um, the issue with the hybrid model of um, learning disorder and therefore hybrid model of assessment is that it's harder when we're looking at adults and young adults as to just how much they have missed as they've moved through the primary and secondary um, years and, and what kind of intervention they've had. It's also the case that unfortunately, um, students with learning disorders may not have been picked up in some education settings if there were a lot of students in their education setting who also had difficulties. So in other words, they don't stand out enough for people to go, I think there's a problem here. Um, they also might be, might be encouraged to go down a slightly less academic pathway. And again, they don't get picked up as having a significant issue. So the unfortunate reality is that we do see, much as we would say that students should be identified in the school years, sometimes, sadly, they are not. And they do arrive in the tertiary setting having never been identified. So when we conduct an assessment, um, it needs to be combined with observations and information from whatever the relevant uh, education provider is or an employer or family members in order for us to get a reasonable picture. Um, there needs to be a detailed assessment of cognitive strengths and weaknesses, as well as the academic skills. Um, and the point of an assessment should be not diagnosis, but to provide information that will guide intervention um, and also, of course, accommodations and adjustments that need to be made. So the key criteria 
um, for learning disorder diagnosis include A, a persistent and enduring difficulty in a key academic skill where intervention has not resulted in the difficulty being uh, redressed and or that we see students making progress but at, at an unusually slow rate. So it's this notion of a persistent and enduring difficulty in a key academic skill, despite some support and intervention. That we would expect students to perform well below chronological age on standardised tests in a key academic skill. So standardised testing tells us that this is a very real problem. The student really is struggling. Now, there is a little bit of an exception to this in that if you have a student who is perhaps identified as gifted and they are performing um, in the average range or at the very low end of the average range, but only with a lot of effort and a lot of support, um, they might meet criteria B um, under those conditions. We would generally see these difficulties beginning in the school age years. But again, as I've mentioned already, not always, because sometimes, unfortunately, students do slip through the gaps um, and they're just kind of moved away from the academic courses that hopefully they should be doing. Um, and they're not given the kind of support and intervention they need. Um, it's also the case that for some students, they do get good instruction, they do get good intervention, um, they do make reasonable progress through primary school and even into secondary, but as the volume of work increases, as the expectations in terms of the sophistication of the material that they're reading increases as well as, um, I don't know why that popped, um, as well as the um, the challenges that, that the expectations in terms of writing increase, suddenly for some students, they just start feeling like they can't cope. They're drowning in this work. And this may be the first time we really pick up a learning disorder. And the fourth um, criteria is that we can't account for these difficulties um, by due to other considerations or more plausible explanations. Um, so we would look at English as additional language or dialect, um, language disorders, um, cognitive disabilities, sensory impairment, lack of instruction, um, socio-emotional difficulties. There may, be, there may be other things that are going on, um, attentional issues. So we might find that there's a more plausible and better explanation for the difficulties the student's having. In order to diagnose, all four criteria need to be met. So we, we have to have A plus B plus C and D all um, being identified and classified. Um, it's also important to think about comorbidity. So when can a learning disorder um, appear alongside another uh, developmental disorder of some sort? And what we find is that um, SLDs commonly co-occur with other developmental or mental um, difficulties and disorders. It needs to be a clinical judgment that's determined, that will determine whether we should be attributing the impairment to learning, the, the learning difficulties, or whether it's another uh, explanation. Where we actually identify um, a more plausible explanation for the student's difficulties, then an SLD should not be diagnosed. Um, we also look at levels of severity and we talk about um, a learning disorder as being mild, moderate or severe. Um, and it's important to think about these three areas because they are determined according to the functional impact that the student is experiencing, not from the results of the testing itself. So what we look at in many ways is the definitional scheme that's attached to DSM-5. And then we look very carefully at the um, corresponding level of independence that the student is able to demonstrate um, in the work that they are doing. So in other words, the functional impact. Where a student requires very limited um, intermittent support, we would say that it's mild. 
where the student requires moderate ongoing support, obviously moderate, or if they require substantial support, we would say that it is severe. So again, we talk about mild um, SLDs as being difficulties learning new concepts and skills. Um, they often, students will often be able, however, to compensate or function well enough that they kind of get by in the classroom or in the course that they're undertaking. Where it's moderate, we start seeing that the individual will not succeed or become proficient, um, certainly in some of the areas, unless there is some support given. Um, so kind of almost doomed for failure without some degree of support. And definitely some accommodations and support services are likely to be needed. When we talk about severe, again, students are unlikely to new, learn new content and skills without some kind of individualised um, support and potentially teaching some actual explicit support through instruction. Um, and that even with a range of accommodations and adjustments, these students may struggle to complete the activities that they're given efficiently or to a high standard. So important to be aware of those things. So that's what we look at when we are looking at an assessment for learning disorder. Um, a question that comes up a lot um, as students get older is how often do we need to reassess um, for learning disorder to be considered a permanent um, part of uh, part of the person's development and functioning. So ultimately, SLDs are by definition persistent and enduring. Um, and once a person has been diagnosed with a learning disorder, it is important to assume that they will always have that learning disorder. Although, of course, um, to varying degrees, what is important, however, to take into account is that when you have a very significant change in diagnostic criteria, then it may be the case that a student is diagnosed under one set of criteria. However, because the criteria has changed and we're now looking at learning disorders in a slightly different way, they would no longer meet that criteria and therefore you know, there would be some some argument to be had that they were no longer should no longer be considered as having that learning disorder um, that had been diagnosed. And and a case in point for this is the discrepancy analysis, where some students who were functioning actually very well um, were given a learning disorder diagnosis, um, even though there was very little um, observable functional impact. Um, so. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of slightly fraught area, but it's one that needs to be taken into consideration. Targeted intervention and appropriate adjustments will definitely reduce the impact of an individual's, um, on the individual's education experience and outcome. So we know that if we provide high quality intervention and high quality adjustments, um, the student will get better results. And again, in many ways, even at a post-secondary level, um, intervention should not be ruled out. Intervention, if it could be made available to a student, should be given consideration. The ability to um, write a well-structured sentence um, is a really important skill that for some students, they actually need to be explicitly taught in, in terms of intervention, rather than just being given an adjustment of more time to write what is still not a very well written sentence, for example. Um, Sorry, what, Mandy, just to quickly interrupt, just 10 minutes to go into a question. Okay. So thank, thank you. you. I, will, I will gallop through to the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is important is that there are changes for different students in the symptoms um, that they display and the functional impact that is occurring for them. So again, as mentioned earlier, a student might work their way all through primary school and partway through secondary school with very a little apparent functional impact. And then the whole kind of house of cards starts to collapse. They really start struggling. The volume of work becomes too much. So we need to be mindful of functional impact. 
Um, this is what's the most important part. So realistically, um, a full psychoeducational assessment shouldn't need to be uh, repeated unless that the original one is well out of date using um, no longer agreed upon criteria. Um, or they were just very young, you know, six, seven or eight or so on. Um, technically, we should be able to say, here's a student who has a learning disorder. The criteria that were used in the original assessment still match up with the criteria we would use today. And therefore we are assuming that they have what is a persistent and enduring developmental disorder. However, we do need to relook at functional impact, which is what is critically important. So this needs to be looked at potentially within the kind of prior two to three years of the student undertaking a particular course or, or training if they have a learning disorder. Um, and it's ideal to look at current achievement levels in the key academic skill that the student has. So the kind of assessment that we would recommend prior to moving into a tertiary course is potentially quite different from the full psychoeducational assessment that might be done for a student the first time they are diagnosed. Um, it's really important to consider functional impact. This is kind of the, the message that's been coming through through a lot of what we've been saying already. The idea that we need to be thinking about intervention, we need to think about the support strategies the student needs um, in relation to the degree of difficulty that they are having. So we need to think about extra working time, perhaps for some students who do have mild um, SLDs. Um, almost certainly we will need to think about extra working time for students with moderate, along with some additional aids um, of some kind, perhaps ICT support. And for students with severe learning disorders, um, we will definitely need a range of um, adjustments to, um, to respond to their functional limitations. So some of the examples um, which are here in your PowerPoint um, include, and I won't read through them all, and you've got them there, but you know, in response to a student who is writing very poorly and has poor reading and writing fluency, um, some of what we need to be seeing or what, what we are likely to see um, are these kinds of issues in terms of their writing and reading, slow and inaccurate, poor comprehension, um, a very high cognitive load attached to the tasks. Um, and therefore our response to that needs to be to address that functional impact. Again, with poor working memory, there are very specific things that um, a student is likely to experience. The functional impact of having very poor working memory um, is going to be felt on in comprehension, particularly if, if we cannot, if a student cannot highlight or make notes. One of the things that comes up at an ATAR level is when the student is given 10 minutes of reading time at the beginning of an exam, this actually almost becomes completely redundant for a student with a reading disorder. If they could highlight and make little notes, then it would be of some value. But the student with really poor working memory, and we saw from the stats that we had, that lots of students with learning disorders have poor working memory. That is a really troublesome period for students when they're sitting there with that 10 minutes and they're not able to make notes or highlight. Um, it actually creates high levels of anxiety which in turn makes their working memory even worse. Low processing speed is obviously going to have an impact on production, the capacity to read um, fluently and so on. Again, we need to think about our responses to that particular functional impact. Um, difficulties with transcription. Um, again, we're kind of looking at the legibility, the level of pain and the output generally when we're thinking about um, the the functional impact for writing. So there's some possible adjustments that are put um, here in a little table against some of these areas. And again, obviously you have access to lots more, um, you know, material to refer to, but it's about matching the adjustment to the area of um, functional impact. Um, 
I just want to talk briefly before we finish up about imputed disability. Um, and in, in cases, um, and I guess there's been a lot, and the reason for this is that there's been a lot more talk about imputed disability of late. Um, the idea that rather than um, actually doing an assessment of some sort, we can look at and impute disability. Um, I think what's important uh, here is that um, it may be possible to impute disability um, for the purposes of determining appropriate support, but we do need to be very careful. Um, our decision has to be based on reasonable grounds and supported by documented evidence. Um, we have to ha have see evidence of functional impact that is resulting from what we are assuming is an undiagnosed disorder, not an alternative cause. So we've got to be super careful that we are not simply seeing a student who is doing very badly in reading or written expression and saying, therefore, they must have a learning disorder. We have to make sure that we're still looking at more plausible explanations and thinking about, we have to be assuming that this is an undiagnosed disorder, not simply looking at the behaviors the student is exhibiting. It has to be consistent with the definition of disorder in DDA and the education and standards. And it's really important that adjustments that are being recommended have been trialed. There cannot be a single data source uh, to diagnose an SLD. And this is the same for imputed disability. There has been at times some talk about just using something like a PATR and saying the student who performs badly on a PATR is kind of maybe we impute disability from that. Again, it's not sufficient and it's not going to determine whether this is an undiagnosed disability. So if we think about imputed disability against the four criteria, we have to think about the supporting evidence that we're looking for for imputed disability against all four criteria. Looking at the persistence and enduring nature of the disability, talking to students about their history, gathering some documentation and getting some information that, that speaks to this persistent and enduring nature and ideally collecting some information about intervention that has been provided. Looking at how well the student does perform, it's very difficult not to actually to make a determination of any kind of learning disorder without doing some standardised testing of where the student is now at in terms of their ability to read or write or um, calculate. Um, we have to look at history again um, in terms of documentation and consultation with the student to think about whether or not there was already indicators of a learning disorder back in primary school, secondary school that perhaps were missed. So again, we need to think about that. And then we need to actually consider when, whether there are some other and more plausible explanations for the difficulties the student is having. So in order to impute disability, we still have to consider those four criteria and really kind of think carefully about them. So I guess um, in terms of sort of bringing this up to the end, and as I say, it has been a bit of a, a, a mad gallop, but there is currently this shift in some systems towards imputed disability as a means of creating a more equitable system. And I kind of support that in many ways. I do feel that we keep, we do need to keep having conversations about how do we make this an equitable system? How do we ensure that the student who, for example, has been to a school where they really just were never picked up or identified, um, ended up being kind of guided off into an alternative uh, non-academic pathway and now has sort of found themselves at a university or somewhere. Um, and really we want to kind of look at um, what's happening for this student, but they can't afford a, a, an assessment. How, how do we ensure that we are kind of making the system more equitable? But what we don't want to do is go down the path where we simply say poor academic results are an indicator of, or achievement is an indicator of a learning disorder because it's not, um, and we just need to be mindful of that. Um, again, what we have to think about is ensuring that policies and procedures um, are fair. Um, we're talking about 
procedural fairness perhaps rather than distributive fairness when we're kind of saying everyone should have the same we have to accept people don't have the same but to have a procedural fairness in place is actually really important so thinking about what that would look like um, particularly in terms of serving the needs and identifying those students who do have an undiagnosed learning disorder um, so I think that kind of, as I say, it was a bit of a mad, mad rush, but um, I think I've kind of hit around about the 50 minute mark. So <laughs> just it's Darlene here, um, just a little bit over Mandy, but thank okay. you so much. Okay. Um, we've had a huge amount of questions um, and we're not going to get to them all. I really apologise to people with just a limited amount of time. Um, we will work with Mandy to see if she's open to answering those and we'll put the um, information on our website when we and we'll send everybody who um, registered for the session today a link to the recording and the page where that information will be there. But we have got a few minutes left. So just probably focusing on two of the most popular questions that we've got. I mean, you probably covered off this a little bit, but it's probably one of the biggest questions we have in the sector of around the benefits of learning assessments, you know, multiple times. So one during school and another when starting a university or in later adult, you know, adolescence. What is the benefits to actually having an assessment if you've got one when you're a young child and then one when you're reaching young adulthood? What are the benefits? Okay, so look, I think it's it's a it's a it is a tricky area. Um and one of the things that I would say is if you have a, an assessment that's been done with a student when they were six or seven years of age, um, there, there are some inherent challenges in that in terms of the amount of information you are going to get from it and the potential for it to be slightly misleading. In other words, student skills are really only just forming when they're six, seven. So although we can identify that a student is, you know, behind their peers, they are struggling, they, there's, there's evidence that they, that they, you know, have needed some intervention and they haven't responded as well to that intervention as we would have liked. It is really important um, for us to potentially have another look at that student later on. Say, you know, the, the, particularly if, for example, the, the determination was that it was a mild learning disorder when they were seven. I, I would be wanting to have a look at it. Now, whether that requires another cognitive assessment, um, probably not. I think what, what is required, however, um, is a comprehensive assessment in the teenage years to determine a, the level of functional impact and whether it has continued, whether it is persistent and what it looks like. What are, what are the real challenges that this student is having? What does that mean in terms of their capacity to access exams, to follow through on assignments, to do lengthy reading tasks? What is, what is the implication there for that student? That is critically important. I think it's also important to identify how well that student is doing on academic standardised tests or in the key area that they are struggling with. So we do what we call a functional review um, of students in their, you know, who are 16, 17, you know, applying for ATAR. If they have had a comprehensive assessment at some point, you know, uh, um, and probably as long as the criteria were not you know, a discrepancy analysis type criteria, and I'm looking at it thinking, okay, you know, I, I've got some issues here. Um, I think that having a um, another, I don't think we need another psychoeducational assessment. We know cognitive ability wise, this student is, is fine. There is not a cognitive um, impairment. So as long as the criteria have remained the same in terms of diagnosis, um, and as long as um, the assessment was done at a time where we got some kind of clear indication at that point of academic achievement fun functional impact, I have seen assessments that have just been done on the basis of a WISC with no academic testing whatsoever. Now, you know, I just think that's not a, a proper assessment. So... Uh, uh, it's really hard to be very definitive about this. What I would say is that I do think functional impact does need to be assessed and a, and a case history of some kind, even if it's a documented little questionnaire that students complete, 
needs to be done within two years of starting the course. That would be Thank my my take. Recommendation. Thank you for that. I'm just looking at the time we are running out. So if I'm unsure you better answer this quickly, but the, the, some of the questions around the, the use of the word difficulty or disability um, difference and not disability, meaning the implications for the individual may not, you know, the supports aren't seen, you know, the supports aren't put in place because those words are used. But also there's another question around, um, you know, not pushing back, but trying, you know, kind of a, something you can say when people are saying it's a, you know, a learning difficulty and not a disability and just kind of, you know, is there a quick little spill that we can give why it's important to actually identify it as, um, you know, as a disability in the in the context of you know in educate in this education space yeah look i think that it i mean it's it's a challenge and i'm, I'm going to struggle to come up with a perfect little you know rejoinder to that but my sense is that if we are saying this is a neurodevelopmental um difficulty that or you know condition that means that for this student in this narrow area they have far more difficulty completing tasks, doing the job, there is an impact on their day-to-day -day functioning. For that reason, we need to kind of consider it as being something that is more than just a difference. It is actually something that, that gets in their way, that um, prevents them from demonstrating um, at, at the level that they can. And we need to be supporting them in that way. And if we do things that take away from that, that just say it's just a difference like everybody else has a difference, then I think that's doing them a disservice, you know, those students. They work yep. bloody hard a lot of the time. So, you know, for me, I don't want to add more to that. Yeah, no, definitely. All right, well, thank you for that. We've come in just under time. Um, we do have another webinar coming up, um, which we will post in the in the chat. So if people would like to see what webinars and also information around our newsletter, to be kept up to date with our um, web regular webinars that we host at this moment, around every two weeks. Um, and yeah, and we'll chat to Mandy about seeing if some of those questions that you've asked today can be answered and that will be put onto our website as well. So refer back to that. So thank you, Mandy, so much. It was wonderful to, to, to be working with you again and to hearing, um, to have this presentation. It's one of the hot topics, probably the most asked for um, topic that we get each, each time we have a survey. So I really appreciate and value the time you've given us. Um, and thank you for everybody for joining us and for participating in the chat really well and for asking some really insightful questions that I'm sorry we didn't get to. So, um, and thank you to our interpreters and our captioner and um, have a good day all. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care. Thank you.